Good evening. I said good evening. Good evening. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Well, that's wonderful. I just want to welcome you all to Men of the Rock Ministries. We want to welcome those who are viewing us online. We want to thank everybody for, for spending your time, which I know is valuable, with us because you believe that the Word of God is valuable. And tonight, um, we're going to be talking about something that is, is it's, it's always heavy on my heart. And the reason why it's heavy on my heart is because throughout my life, I've had battles of addictions to drugs and alcohol and pornography and various vices that that was detrimental to me being a being productive as a man and over that tenure I've I've watched other men uh, struggle through various addictions um, and what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about breaking the power of addictions over your life. It's going to shock you a little bit what we're going to talk about because it's not what you expect. You know, whenever we start talking about addictions, normally everyone focuses right away to drugs and alcohol. But as you study the Word of God, you find that that's just one category of addictions that that all humanity face. In fact, everybody in this room is struggling with addictions right now, including myself. And you say, well, that, what are you saying, Brother Dave? I'm, I'm saying that because we're, we're born in, in, a, in a world where we learn to be addicted to our five physical senses, that we learn how to live through our senses rather than through the way that God intended for us to live. And because of that, many times uh, people try to find fulfillment in various things and ultimately find themselves grasping for straws. I've been fortunate in, in my life to, to grab hold of certain truths in the Word of God that, that freed me from many of the vices that I had in life. Um, for those of you who have battled alcoholism, I mean, for over a decade, I drank over, over two 1.75 liters of vodka every week for his, and I don't count what else I drink. I coupled those addictions to maintain uh, the ability to to work and everything with a cocaine addiction. So I I kind of put drugs together so that I could maintain what I was doing and and I watched I'm not only me, but I've watched new, countless people. I've also lost my youngest son to a heroin addiction, and uh, I've watched him OD several times. When I was 13 years old, I, I OD'd of drugs. So I say all that to say this, that... Humanity has a tendency of painting a bleak picture. But Jesus showed up on the scene 2,000 years ago with a different message, with different results. And what I want to do tonight is I want to just hit on some highlights that may help people who are trying to break the powers of, of, of the flesh over their life. And, and give them 
the tools that will equip them to live out their potential while they're on the earth. Now you could say, well, I don't have any addictions. I guarantee you, you have addictions. Anything from anger to some, some people like depression. It amazes me how many people love to be depressed. It's the, the, the chemicals that are released in certain, certain uh, activities and behaviors. Uh, I watch people gamble and they gamble their livelihoods away. I grew up where a father was, my father was controlled by, by gambling. What was, he, what was he controlled by? It wasn't the money associated with it. It was the, the feeling that he got when he was at a poker table. So in general, we learn to live for our feelings. And one of the things that I always am trying to get people to do to understand is that you were never created by God to live for feeling. Your feelings, we live in a hypersensitive society. We live in a society that is, for the last 300 years in particular, philosophies has been introduced to society that has, has really done damage to people's ability to function the way God created them to function. Those philosophies teach people that, hey, your feelings are of paramount importance. Your feelings should dictate the actions of your life. And you see, I watch people every day live their lives like that. I lived my life like that for, for 48 years, really. Okay? What, how are we to live if we're not to live by our feelings? God created you for purpose. He created you to have a destiny governed by his desires for your life. Every one of us in this room and everybody looking at me online, you have a purpose for your existence. It's never, the end goal is never happiness. Happiness will come and go in your life. I, it took me a long time to, to get this. It took me a long time not to pursue happiness. I was a person who was always chasing happiness, and it was like the wind. I would find happiness for fleeting moments of my life, and then all of a sudden it would dissipate in thin air. And once I began to look at the word and, and how God created me to function, I realized Jesus, when he walked the, the earth, he walked the earth to fulfill a mandate that was on his life. And everything that he did basically was designed to, to fulfill that destiny. He created you to fulfill a destiny. As long as you live for self-fulfillment, you'll always fall short. Now, when we find ourselves in the height of trying to change our behaviors. There, are a lot of times, man, people always will say, man, I talked to a gentleman an hour and a half ago. He says, tell me what to do, how to stop this madness. This is what the gentleman told me. And I sit there and I said, I can't give you in 20 words what to do. I said, but what we have to do is we have to turn to God's knowledge in order to begin to 
to get a hold of the real truth because it's in God's truth that we ultimately experience life the way he ordained it to be experienced. So with those thoughts in mind, I want to start off with a word of prayer. If you guys will stand to your feet, I'll wake you up tonight. Let's just ask the Holy Spirit to unveil to us these truths in a way that it would be digested into our lives so that we can always have a heart to chase the destiny of God in our life. Father, we come to you right now asking you that you would bless this meeting. We ask for your anointing of the spirit of the living God to come upon my tongue and allow the words that I speak to be your words and not my thoughts. I give you praise and I give you glory for what you're doing in these men's lives. I thank you, Father, for revolutionizing their mindsets and causing them to experience life the way that you prepared before the foundation of the world for them to experience it. And I give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Okay. I'm going to start off in Matthew 4, 17. Jesus had just got done with the Mount, tempta mount of Temptation. He just beat up Satan at his own game and he had was getting ready to enter into the villages to preach and teach the kingdom of God and he said something that his forerunner was saying to everyone he said from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. There's two things that are operating. Number one, he's telling people that they need to repent because something's happening. Okay? As we go forth in this study tonight, you're going to see that the kingdom of God that became manifest when Jesus was raised from the dead produces the power in your life to overcome all sorts of behavioral patterns that was once so solidified in your actions. So he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The word repent is an interesting word. We always hear it in religious settings. But the Greek word for repent really means to change your mind and to have the mindset that we got to go in a different direction than we're going right now. How many of you in your life have reached points in your life where you said, man, I need to change? I did that this morning. I need to change. Okay? As you grow in your relationship with God, you're going to live in a perpetual state of change and an attitude of being conformed to who he created you to be in him. I always tell you guys that if you want to see who you really are, allow the Spirit of God to unveil Jesus to you because his characteristics are really what you were created to function like. Okay? Repentance is a term that we lose a lot of people with. Because as soon as you start talking about repent, people shut you down. This, you know, give you an example. The first message that was preached after Jesus' resurrection, Peter stood up at the day of Pentecost and begin to convey 
the truth of who Jesus was, what he accomplished, and the fact that he was raised from the dead. And as he was explaining to them the, 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 the basic message of what we would know it as the gospel or the good news of the kingdom, they, the Bible says that they were cut to the heart and asked Peter, what should they do? Peter responded, repent, just like the master, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins. And that message of repentance started to flow throughout the apostle's message. The apostle Paul, probably about 12 years later, was on Mars Hill at the area of Pegasus, and he was getting ready to engage the philosophers of the day and, he, and tell them about Jesus of Nazareth who came to bring the kingdom of God to people's life. And he said something in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. He said that times of ignorance Times of ignorance is over. Now God commands all men everywhere to repent. Think about that. God commands us to repent. Everybody in the world, he's commanded basically to believe on his son, Jesus Christ, and to repent. Repent of what? This is where it gets good. Most people, when they're assessing their life, we're taught by materialists that the intrinsic truth about human beings is, is that they're good. And that basically we gauge how good we are and we compare it to one another. If somebody that is child molester and a murderer is compared to a guy that works nine to five, gets off, he, he raises a little cane, but he's not really as bad as the other guy, then he's really a good guy. But the standard for our lives is set in by our Creator. Our creator is what we call holy. He is the standard of the universe. So when we begin to gauge ourselves, when we do it by comparing ourselves to others, we misconceptualize truth. And as we misconceptualize the truth, we begin to rationalize and justify the state of our being. And if we do that enough, we get to a place to where we're in delusion. We're incapable of understanding the, the truth of where we're at in life. Learning the importance of comparing ourselves to the truth is a key, a key factor in you growing up in life. You growing up in God. If you compare yourself to other Christians, you could sit here and you could have a false realization of where you're at in the eyes of your relationship to God. God, the Bible says that we were preordained before the foundation of the world to be conformed to the image of his son, to the likeness of his son. The gauge for, for, for me 
as a man of God is, and that's why I spend a lot of time repenting. That's why I spend a lot of time trying to, to make corrections in my ideas of how I live life. Not in no, no way, shape, or form do I feel condemned. I feel like I'm being challenged by the one who put me here to maximize my potential on this earth. To me, it's not a bad thing to look into the perfect law of liberty and realize that if I lie, it's wrong. That's a good thing. If you lie and think it's not wrong, then you really have a problem. Or if you think that it's okay to, to be drunk and insubordinate and not listen to authority and all these other different issues in our life, you're living in delusion. Because what we find out is God's always right. God is the standard, man. God is the standard. The Apostle Paul was dealing with the Church of Corinth. In the Church of Corinth, there was some sexual immorality going on, and nobody was dealing with the issues. And Paul wrote them a letter telling them about themselves and telling them that they needed to exercise judgment in the area of when people are living wrong. And he wrote them a, a second letter, and this is what he said in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, or the same letter made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Hear what I'm saying. There's, a, there's something that we call, I'm sorry, that produces death in our life. But there is godly sorrow that produces true repentance in our life. I met that place in my life seven years ago where when I was at the point in my life to where I didn't want to live life no more. I had put everything in me that I could put in me. I could remember sitting in front of mounds of cocaine, testing, seeing how my, much my heart could take. And in all those situations, in all those self-destructive modes, I can never get away from the reality that I knew God wanted me to conform to what he put me here for. So one night, I stood out there and I said, Lord, I said, I'm tired. I'm done. That's it. I'm not doing this no more. I had reached a point in my life where godly sorrow had come over my life to the point to where I gave up. Now here, watch this. When I got to that point in my life, true repentance was happening. When true repentance happened, the power of God met repentance and freed me. I didn't have to go to 12 step, 13 step, 14 steps. I had one encounter with God, and God, in his miraculous power, came, came into my spirit, totally washed away everything that I had, and I began to experience life in a new way. 
power met repentance. I'm telling you that the kingdom of God is present on the earth. And the kingdom of God is here to rid you of anything that's contrary to God in your life. He designed the system. He put it in place so that you could cure bad behaviors by something. All throughout scripture, man, hear what I'm telling you. All throughout scripture, God used his prophets to, to tell people to do one thing, repent. We don't like this in we don't like this anymore because now the philosophies that have been handed to us through mediums that has inundated us, they, they teach us that if something makes us feel bad, then it's bad. So now something that is good becomes bad because we're taught that if something makes us feel uncomfortable or, or bad, then it's, it's not right. It's not love. Okay? Hear what I'm telling you. Because I love you guys, and I love everybody listening to me. Trust me, I'm not banging nobody on the head because I repent all the time. Listen to me. You, when you live your life in Christ, you go through a process that we call sanctification. You go through a process of being purified by the fire of God in your life. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, man. It's a good thing to be challenged by the word of God. Now, I said I was going to surprise you tonight. And this is what I'm going to surprise you about. God wants you to be addicted. Everybody on this planet has an addictive personality. Some, some people say, oh, you've got an addictive personality. Everybody's got an addictive personality. They're addicted to something, okay? We were created by God for dependency. This is big. It's big in a man's life because we're taught that we're to be independent and that we're to be self-sufficient and that we're to be self-made. And the truth of the matter is, is every single one of us is none of those things. That's why we spend our life trying to find fulfillment in something that leads us in the paths of destruction. Watch this. Once you come to, you, to a place of repentance in your life, you've got to realize you've got to replace your addiction with another addiction. Look at Ephesians 5, 17, 18. It says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation or overflow, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul is saying, hey, don't get drunk with wine, man. Be drunk with the Spirit. Replace one thing with another because you're always a slave to something. You're never free in life. Hear what I'm telling you. You're always bound to the choice that you make every day in your life. Every choice that you make in life, you're bound to that choice. So you're never free of anything. Watch what the Apostle Paul taught in the sixth chapter of Romans. He said, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been, been set free from sin, 
you became what? Slaves of what? Righteousness. So basically, the kingdom of God comes upon our lives and we trade, we trade one set of addictions for a whole new set of addictions. I get up every morning and it, I am addicted to the word of God. I'm addicted to the presence of God. I'm addicted to experience God in my morning devotional. I want to be with God. Well, I'm addicted. I do it subconsciously because it's a, it has become an addiction. I am doing exactly what the apostle talked about and a lot of people don't even realize that that's true. People always say, well, it takes 90 days to change a habit. If, how, how many? 21 days, okay? He says it takes 21 days to change a habit. So if you, if you take one habit and you don't do that for 21 days and you break it, what are you going to do with that when you were doing that? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You're going to replace it with something else. How many times people stop smoking cigarettes and they start eating candy. They're replacing one thing for the other. The truth of the matter is, and this is why it's so important to be in relationship with the Lord on an intimate level, the truth of the matter is, is, is that, that all those things that we were replacing them with needs to go too. Praise God. Learn how to be addicted to your creator. Learn how to long after his knowledge. Learn how to long after his wisdom. The Proverbs say that wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is how to govern your affairs of life according to the knowledge of God. How many of you wake up during the day and say, man, God, teach me how to do this. Teach me how to effectively encounter life in a way where I'm not always tripping over myself. That should be a big time prayer, man. We've all hit wall after wall after wall in our life. So what we want to do is we want to start to replace the world with him. Replace the knowledge of the earth with the knowledge of truth. You can't, you can't live according to the ways of the world and produce heavenly results in your life. So, we come to a place of repentance. We learn to live a life of repentance. We learn that we're being shaped and molded into the character of Christ. And then we learn that we are addicts. So we got to be addicted to the right thing. And after that, something has to happen. This is the most exciting part of this session. I want you to go over to Luke 4.16 through 21. And we're going to bring this home. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty 
to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant. And he sat down, and all the eyes were upon him. And he began to say to them, Today, watch this, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The most important part of you receiving deliverance from any addiction is that you believe that you've been free. We, we spoke the last session about the importance of believing the reality of God's truth before they manifest. Every time I hear somebody say that I'm a drug addict or I'm an alcoholic, or I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm immediately, I think to myself, they're gonna have a gonna have a long day because they believe that's who they are. Hear what I'm telling you. Jesus said what? Whatever we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. We're going to have what we say, right? That's, that, you might as well pin that up on your mirror in the house and look at it every day. Whatever I believe in my heart and say with my mouth, I'm going to have exactly what I say. That should be a driving force in your understanding for life because it's a spiritual law that cannot be negated. Believe that you're free. Jesus said this. He said the spirit of the Lord. Now, I want you to picture this day. He's in his hometown of Nazareth at a synagogue. All these people grew up with him. They all knew him as the carpenter's son, Joseph. He stands up just to read a verse of scripture. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Is anybody brokenhearted? Is anybody brokenhearted? He said to proclaim liberty. I'm come here to give you liberty if you're captive to something. He says to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of jubilee, of freedom, freedom from the debt of sin, freedom from the debt of pornography, freedom from the debt of alcohol, freedom from the debt of drugs, freedom from the debt of anger, freedom from the debt of wrath, freedom from the debt of laziness. It happened that day in Nazareth. He said... In your ears, this is fulfilled in your hearing. If I could get people to believe the truth, things would fall off of them like nothing. My job as a minister of the good news of Jesus Christ is to tell people that they're free, not that they're going to be free. Not that if we, if we do this and we do that, it's already happened. It happened 2,000 years ago. And if you're not free, it's because you haven't entered into the revelation of truth that came with the good news of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. When Jesus walked up and he saw people that was bound by a demonic spirit, he didn't say that they had, they had PTSD. They, you know what he said? He said he didn't relegate it to some because psychiatrists and because of people who are in the sciences, can't explain things. What do they do? They put conditions on people. 
The truth is, if Jesus of Nazareth was standing before you today, he would say, be free in Jesus' name. Be free. I come to set the captives free, he said. You're free. He who the Son sets free is free. You're free from the bondage of sin, sickness and disease and death. Take hold, man. Listen to what I'm telling you. Emphysema. I don't care what malady you're experiencing. The power of Jesus Christ is here to heal. Because all we do is receive something that already happened. We receive what's already occurred. You don't ever, God doesn't ever save anybody. Do you know that? We said, well, we just believe in God. We're gonna, this person is going to get saved. The truth is that he already saved them 2,000 years ago. They've got to get revelation of the truth. That's the truth. He ain't never going to die on the cross again, and he's never going to be raised from the dead again. That was a one-time event. And he provided enough power. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he provided enough power at that moment to cause all of history to be conformed to his image. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To proclaim liberty to those who are captive by your five physical senses, man. Wake up tomorrow morning, look in the mirror and say, listen to me, you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do. I'm governed by the Spirit of God. And I am what he says I am. And I believe that today I'm going to be obedient to my Father in heaven. I'm going to control the words of my mouth, and I'm not going to just say anything that I want to say. I was in a situation today. I was in an office. And, man, a conversation was happening, and I went to speak. And immediately it was like a door trap. Pow! It just stopped. So, encapsulating everything that we've talked about tonight. Repentance is a positive. Repentance, being sorry for not doing what your heavenly father would want you to do, that's a positive thing, man. Sometimes when you're, when you're wrestling with life, man, it's okay to wrestle as long as you're going toward truth because this is a journey. And revelation knowledge, why do you think Paul never prayed for people to, to he always wanted them to ha have a revelation of what God had done in their life. That's what he prayed for. I pray for you guys. When I pray for you, I'm always praying that you'll know what happened 2,000 years ago. That somehow, some way, the Spirit of God would, would unveil to you, to you, who you really are. The authority that you have in life. So that you don't have to be captive in the cords of this world system, man. I love you guys. I love you guys. I really do. And I'm, 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 man, tonight, I'm telling you, I'm giving you my heart because this is, this is what I got, man. I'm telling you, it's over. It is finished. When Jesus said it is finished, it's, it's finished. It's no longer. You don't have to be bound anymore. Believe it to the dictate. When you believe that angel, all the wrestling is done. When you really believe the truth about yourself, not the characterizations that have been implanted by the God of this world in causing you 
to feel like you're never going to get it right. Stand to your feet now. Father, help us to see the truth. Father, help us see you for who you really are in our life. Father, help us to know who you made us to be in your Son. We come to you tonight humbly, humbly, humbly before your throne of grace to obtain mercy in the time of need. I charge you by the Spirit of God that you put off the old man and put on the new man that created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Rid yourself of all the filth of the flesh in the Spirit and allow yourself to be perfected in Him in true holiness in the fear of the Lord. Know that the power of my spirit is upon you in your life. Know that as you hunger and you thirst for more of me, the reservoirs of truth will be flowing through your entire being. And you will see who you really are. Don't look to the right nor to the left, but keep your eyes focused upon the one who delivered you 2,000 years ago. And your ways will be totally irrigated by my life. And as you walk the paths, of your futures, you'll know that I am with you. And people will see me in you. And people will fear their creator. Worship him in your own words. Father, we just worship you tonight. We worship you as men that have been consecrated to the cause of Christ. We come to you tonight just worshiping you, magnifying you for being who you are and creating in us a new heart and a new mind. your deliverance tonight. Thank you that a spark has ignited each of us that will cause us to have a new perspective on the challenges that are in our path. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. You guys fellowship some tonight. Take the time to Brother Brother Hector. Fellowship, man. Fellowship.